Who's been hacking aerospace firms? Context security suggests it's a new Chinese threat actor, Avivor. The FBI issues a ransomware alert. The NCSC warns of active exploitation of vulnerable VPNs. The EU issues a sweeping takedown order to Facebook. U.S. senators ask Facebook about deep fakes. Spear phishing at the Australian National University. FireEye may be for sale. And the Sandcat threat group shows poor OPSEC. And now a word from our sponsor, Observe-It. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in, it's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys. Your employees, contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe it enables security teams to detect risky user activity, investigate incidents in minutes, and effectively respond. With Observe It, you know the whole story. Get your free trial at observeit.com slash cyberwire. That's observe, the letter I, the letter T, dot com forward slash cyberwire. And we thank Observe It for sponsoring our show. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by BugCrowd, connecting organizations with the top security researchers, pen testers, and white hat hackers in the world to identify 10 times more vulnerabilities than scanners or traditional pen tests. Learn more about how their award-winning platform provides actionable insights like remediation advice to help fix faster while methodology-driven assessments ensure compliance needs are met at bugcrowd.com. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, October 3rd, 2019. In a year where CrowdStrike finds cyber criminals more active than state sponsored hackers, Chinese intelligence services have been taking a leading role in industrial espionage. Someone, and most signs point to China, has certainly been poking into the networks of aerospace companies and their suppliers. Airbus is the most prominent of these firms that have been so prospected. The company disclosed in January that business systems at its commercial aircraft division had been hacked and that data had been improperly accessed. Last week, Asian's France Press, citing security sources, reported that the company had continued to sustain security incidents, several of which affected its suppliers, among them the British engine manufacturer Rolls-Royce, the French technology consultancy Expleo, and two other unidentified French companies. Most of the speculation about specific attribution has turned to APT-10, also known as Stone Panda, and which CrowdStrike earlier last month associated with the Tianjin Bureau of the Ministry of State Security, MSS for short. Other researchers thought the attackers most likely to belong to Jiangsu Province Ministry of State Security, JSSD for short, The U.S. Department of Justice has indicted members of JSSD in the past for hacking, and the group has a special interest in aerospace companies. But the London-based security firm Context believes a different threat actor is responsible. In fact, Context believes it's found a previously unremarked threat actor that's engaging in living off the land as it island hops across targets in the aerospace supply chain. They've given the group its own name, Avivor, that is, eater of birds, which seems apt for something that preys on the aerospace sector. Context acknowledges that there are some similarities among Avivor and both JSSD and Stone Panda, but they've concluded that the tactics, techniques, and procedures, infrastructure, and tooling observed differ significantly, and that while they can't rule out the involvement of the other two groups, it seems likely to them that Avivor represents a different organization. The group's attacks display good OPSEC, and the researchers note in particular the group's attention to removal of forensic artifacts, a sign of its desire to remain as obscure as possible. Contrast this with the somewhat willful noisiness of some other state actors. Fancy Bear broke onto the scene, for example, with considerable eclat, not seeming to care a great deal whether it was detected or not, and that was a matter of style, not incompetence. Whoever Avivor is, the group is probably Chinese, probably state-directed, and almost certainly concerned with industrial espionage. Israel is a major player in the cybersecurity ecosystem, with significant research and innovation originating in that country. It's also a hot market for venture capital. 
Yoel Leidersdorf heads up VC company YL Ventures. Israel is uh, the number two country in the world in terms of cybersecurity exports, and that's just one uh, measurement. I would say it's number two in absolute numbers in terms of number of startups, um, cybersecurity startups. It's also number two in terms of uh, venture capital funding in cybersecurity. Um, and that's especially impressive since Israel only has about 8 million people, you know, much fewer than, than what the U.S. has and many other countries have. The total amount of funding for Israeli cybersecurity companies across all stages grew 22% from 2017 to 2018. Uh, in 2018, we had over a billion dollars, actually 1.03 billion um, of uh, total funding for, for security startups in Israel. And as I mentioned, that is number two um, in the world. Also in t- 2018, we had 66 new companies uh, founded in Israel in cybersecurity, which is a growth of uh, 10% over 2017. Um, the average seed rounds are getting bigger, so 3.6 million in 2018 up from 3.3 million in 2017. Most of the, the new companies are in emerging fields, meaning uh, in, in Israel, meaning, meaning completely new fields in cybersecurity, which is very interesting because uh, it's not more of the same, but rather we're seeing um, lo- lots, of new, uh, lots of new innovation. Now you compare that with, uh, with any uh, other region in the world, and these stats are extremely impressive. I mean, especially the, the absolute numbers of dollars invested and in, in, in number of companies formed. You don't really have that anywhere in the world except for the U.S. And think about, you know, all the different regions in the U.S. where cybersecurity is uh, is strong, like, uh, you know, the Virginia Corridor, Silicon Valley, Boston, um, all these areas. Um, Israel is a very, very small place. So you can get from one end to the, to the other in terms of, you know, what's interesting in, in, in the security industry within about an hour's drive. When you look around at uh, the state of things when it comes to investing in cybersecurity, where do we find ourselves today? Uh, this is a very exciting time to be in cybersecurity. I think it's one of the highest uh, growth sectors in venture capital overall. Um, it's it's driven by by many factors. I mean, I could say, uh, you know, first of all, the movement to the cloud um is is really uh, increasing the uh, security concerns that organizations have, and therefore their budgets. Another one is uh, is IoT, uh, Internet of Things. We're expected to triple uh, the number of Internet of Things by 2025 to about 22 billion devices, um, uh, and a lot of them are unprotected. You know, security spend worldwide is is over 100 billion a year now, and that's and that's growing year over year. I think by 2021 we're going to be at 133 billion, according to Gartner. Uh, the cost of cyber crime is uh, is was about 600 billion in 2017, and is is much higher now. Um, you know, the number of data breaches that's a big driver. I, I'm sure you you've seen a lot of that. Um, I mean, we've gone from about 800 in 2015 to about 1600 in 2017. That's in just two years, the doubling of the number of breaches. Um, and security is now uh, a, a top uh, topic uh, in in boards of directors. Um, and of course, there's a big shortage of of cybersecurity professionals. About three million people um, that are needed worldwide. And so, you know, all of these are driving demand for cybersecurity. Um, and of course, the business we're in is investing in um, cybersecurity startups that are meeting this demand. So, I mean, our, our whole goal and, and reason for, for existence here is to uh, supply the world with, with some great solutions. Um, in our case, these solutions originate in Israel, which is um, the number two exporter in the world. Um, in terms of security solutions. So that's, Mm. you know, that's the world that we're in. That's Yoav Leidersdorf of YL Ventures. There have been some official warnings of cyber threats in both Britain and the U.S. The U.S. FBI has issued an alert that ransomware represents a high-impact threat. The Bureau urges victims to report the incidents to their local FBI field office, and it strongly recommends that no one pay the ransom. Doing so at this point is simply fueling the bandit economy that keeps ransomware in circulation. The UK's National Cybersecurity Center warns of pervasive exploitation of widely used VPNs. They're not scrub VPNs either, but rather the products of respected vendors PulseSecure, 
Palo Alto Networks, and Fortinet. Both British and international organizations are being targeted, and the NCSC says the victims include government, military, academic, business, and healthcare organizations. They advise everyone using the affected VPNs apply the latest patches, and all three vendors have them, and reset their authentication credentials. The New York Times reports that the European Court of Justice ruled today that national courts may order Facebook to take down and restrict access to content globally. The case originated with an Austrian Green Party politician who requested removal of unflattering comments an unnamed individual had posted to a personal page. The plaintiff alleged that three bits of content were impermissibly objectionable. Specifically, she objected to traitor of the people, corrupt clod, and fascist. The decision is sweeping and will have the effect of pushing social networks toward treatment like publishers as opposed to common carriers. Skeptics note that European law has tended to restrict disrespectful posts about politicians more readily than it has quelled extremism or invasions of pure personal privacy. But then it stands to reason that politicians might just be better resourced than your average Zuzi Mustafrau or Janie Sixpack. Facebook is also receiving attention across the Atlantic. The social network yesterday received a letter from U.S. Senators Warner, Democrat of Virginia, and Rubio, Republican of Florida, asking for an explanation of its policies and technical capabilities with respect to deepfakes and fabricated news generally. An Australian National University review of its data breach concludes that the hackers got in by spearfishing a senior member of the university's staff. The Australian Financial Review reports that ANU declined to name a culprit, but called the attackers sophisticated and probably interested in fraud. Ten Daily says the phishing victim simply previewed the email and didn't interact with it in any other way. Business Insider says FireEye has retained Goldman Sachs as the security company explores putting itself up for sale. FireEye stock has been up on the news, trading around $14 since it broke. The likeliest buyers are thought to be private equity investors. And finally, to return to the issues of OPSEC and state-directed threat groups, here's one that seems decidedly not to have its security house in order. It's the group security researchers at Kaspersky calls Sandcat, which is believed to be a cyber operations unit of Uzbekistan State Security Service, the SSS, which inherited a reputation for repression and brutality with its KGB DNA. Kaspersky described its findings to Vice. First of all, Sandcat used the name of an associated military group to register one of the domains used in its infrastructure. This is held to be bad by those in the business. If you're registering a domain, use some anodyne but plausible front organization, maybe the young person's chess clubs of Greater Bukhara. Second of all, they had installed Kaspersky security software in their systems, and that software is reckoned both effective and intrusive, with a pretty big footprint in the systems it protects. Thus, Kaspersky had pretty good visibility into things that would raise any security eyebrows, like buying a bunch of zero days from third parties. So the gaff was blown pretty quickly. Kaspersky researchers said they were surprised to see that Uzbekistan's SSS had any cyber operational capability at all. Some of that can be written off to the casual disregard with which the Central Asian members of the near abroad tend to be disregarded. But those who have eyes to see, let them see. The researcher known as Phineas Fisher said in 2015 that he'd found a good bit of email correspondence between the Uzbek organs and the Italian lawful intercept firm of Hacking Team. And now a word from our sponsor, Edwards Performance Solutions. It's commonly accepted that cybersecurity is a business risk, not an IT problem. What may not be as commonly accepted is that cybersecurity needs to be an integral part of every business strategy, and that cybersecurity can actually be an asset to your business. Achieving this outcome is a journey the journey starts with an understanding of what information is important to the business, what business processes generate, use, store, or transmit that information, and what are the rules and regulations impacting the information. The next part of the journey is understanding the risks to the business and those information assets, followed closely by establishing a governance structure to manage those business risks. This includes managing the risk to your supply chain. 
The journey is not an easy one and is fraught with roadblocks and obstacles. You may need a guide. Edwards Performance Solutions is ready to be your guide in this journey. Please visit their website edwps.com to learn more. That's edwps.com. And we thank Edwards Performance Solutions for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Craig Williams. He's the head of Talos Outreach at Cisco. Uh, Craig, great to have you back. Uh, you all recently published some information as a blog post titled, Open Document Format Creates Twist in Maldoc Landscape. Uh, what's going on here? Well, so this is a very interesting one, right? Um, you know, we've all known Maldocs exist, and we all know that you need to be worried about them. Um, but what this particular attacker did was very, very clever. They found an issue and you know, an open office format called ODT or open document. Mm -hmm. um, and they were able to, you know, basically discover that if you exploited the ODT file type, not only were you able to compromise uh, open office, but Microsoft office would actually fall victim to the same or a very similar bug resulting in them getting the execution that they wanted. Hmm. So think about this, right? You get an ODT file, um, and let's let's say you're super savvy, right? And maybe even your security software warns you, or you know that ODT is open office, and so you think, ha ha ha, silly hacker, I run Microsoft Office, I'm far superior and can't be compromised. Mm -hmm. Well, you might click on it to see what it is, because you know deep down that you're not running any sort of open software, and so therefore you shouldn't be vulnerable. However, <laughs> that's not the case here. Um, and so I think by using this format to target both sets of victims, the attacker actually has a much wider net than we would normally consider. And because it's an ODT format, a lot of the detection technology, particularly in things like antivirus, may not actually work as effectively as they should. Hmm. Now, do you have a sense that this is an intentional misdirection or, or is it a happy accident for them that it that's effective within the actual Microsoft environment? Oh, I'm I'm pretty sure that this is intentional. Okay. Uh, you know, the things that they're using are things like PowerShell that are very generically used in word attacks. And so I think what happened was they basically found a particular technique that worked in both and decided to make use of it uh, because it, it does double your potential pool of victims. Hmm. So what are we looking at here in terms of recommended protections? Well, the gist of it here is, you know, the, the same type of advice we would give anyone for a malicious document campaign. I mean, number one, don't ever click on an email attachment unless you're confident who sent it and you know that they intentionally attached it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, number two, make sure you're running some sort of antivirus product so that if the file is known to be malware, it actually gets convicted and removed from your system before you can open it. I suppose for number three, we could throw out there, make sure you have a firewall on so that in the event you do click on it, perhaps it won't be able to reach out and grab the actual additional payload. I see. Do you have any sense for how successful this is or how widespread it is? Uh, so this one we think we found pretty early. We did not see a ton of attachments in our email telemetry. Um, now, it is possible that there were very isolated, heavily targeted pockets like we've seen in the past, uh, very specific industries, very specific countries. But from a global perspective, it does appear to be very limited. So hopefully we got the word out in time. The blog post is titled, Open Document Format Creates Twist in Maldoc Landscape. Craig Williams, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at observit.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our amazing CyberWire team is Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>